Gay, lovely to see you here in England again. 7,000 winners, 140 Group 1s, a trainer who's just been inducted into the Sports Australia Hall of Fame at the back end of last year. But I've been told that a new lease of training life, what spurs you on when you've achieved so much in your career? Well, I suppose I want a long activity, don't I, Nick, as most trainers do. So I had met and worked with young Adrian Bott. Uh, he was uh, extremely intelligent and uh, very um, diligent and had a real feel for the, which is important. And he came to me and he said, uh, if you want to sell your business, I have an investor who might buy it and, you know, I'd like to run it. And, but he said, I want you to stay on. I said, I'm delighted. It sounds fantastic. And it was a marriage made in heaven. And you've always said that you would never give up. You wanted to go training. You never wanted to stop and retire and do anything different or essentially get old. You wanted to carry on. But people don't realise, they keep talking about retirement, but when you retire, and I have no idea what it's like, but if one was to retire, the phone stops, your standing in people's minds or perception drops, and uh, I think it would be a very lonely life. It's nice to be wanted, nice to be wanted, one by my husband and children and grandchildren, but it's also nice to be wanted by Adrian and the team and, and, and the owners. It's, it's very nice. And I'm guessing you're somebody who's always wanted to embrace everything in life rather than say, I'll either do this or that or the other. You're somebody temperamentally, from what I've read and seen, who wants to do this and this and this and this. Yes, my daughter Kate says, you're one of those that always say, um, I, what, I wish, a I, I, I FOMA, FOMA, whatever it is, you know, you, you wish that you were doing what you're not doing, and that's me, very much me, you know, I'm thinking, am I missing out on this? <laughs> and you haven't missed out on much. Just tell me about what an honour it was to be inducted into the, the Sports Australia Hall of Fame. It really is the highest accolade for for somebody in, in, in Australia and, and joining your father, TJ Smith, as one of only five people in the sport of horse racing to, to, to be in that list. It, it was uh, quite, uh, um, it, it, I felt, uh, firstly I was hugely honoured, secondly I, didn't, I thought they'd made a mistake, the person, when Bruce McAverney rang me, I said, look, you made a mistake, Bruce, <laughs> I don't think you'd be really inducting me. And, and it was very, um, you know, you, you felt sort of very humbled. Uh, you know, when you see so many great sports people and, and hear their stories, because of course they interview them on stage, and you're not interviewed by just uh, anyone, you're interviewed by another great sports person who's also achieved all those heights in their own career. Uh, you know, it, it was really a, a very moving time, and Rob and Kate and Tom, our two children, and our friends, that small group of really close friends we had with us and family, were all so moved by it. It was very lovely, really lovely. I was really honoured. And, and everything you've ever done, you've always referenced your father, who was such a legendary figure, and, and with you, whom you had such a, a close bond as his, as his only child. What was it about him that, that made him such a pioneer? Well, he... He came from nothing, Nick, and when you've got nowhere else to fall, you've got that, that's it, the, the, you know, the dirt floor of a Gulgawi shanty that they lived in, you've only got one way. You can't go down, so you have to go up. And he was determined to leave the bush, which he saw as poverty and hard work and a hardship. And he wasn't a man scared of hard work, but he just wanted to get away from the shackles of it. And he, he did exactly that. And it was so funny because the story goes that he has a little boy and another little boy sitting on the train from wherever it was in New South Wales, traveling to Victoria. One said, I'm going to be champion trainer. And the other boy said, I'm going to be champion jockey. And of course, the other boy was George Moore, the famous jockey in Australia. And they teamed up together Very to, much win so. the, to win the derby. No, they teamed up together for over probably 25 years for one of the most tumultuous, brilliant relationships on, on and off the turf. Quite remarkable. When you were growing up with, with horses around you, was it, a, was it a glamorous upbringing or was it an upbringing you associated with hard graft? No, very much. It, it was, first of all, uh, it was our life. And, you know, anyone watching the show who's been brought up in a stable or with a parent that's involved in stable life, running a stable, knows that it's not glamorous. You know, it's, it's what you take as normal. You know, you go and you see the, the straw and, the, and the, 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 the horse's droppings and you see the boys mucking it out or girls mucking it out and, uh, you know, you, you, the whole sort of life and blood of, of the stables is really about hard work and, and long, longish hours 
uh, and funny hours too, you know, very much sort of a, a person in uh, television would understand perfectly. That ability to combine selling horse racing as, as show business essentially, but also applying those, that strict discipline, it's, has that been quite a difficult balance to strike? No, Dad was a very much, <clears throat> to say he was a disciplinarian is wrong, but he was a very, uh, a person who uh, was very precise and, and uh, ran his life both on the course and off the course with great precision. You know, he was a very, he was a very brilliant person who had had basically no education at all. It's a funny story, he, he went to the school, he had to ride, I don't know, for, for so many miles to get there on his little pony. When he got there, he was late and the teacher said, Smith, come up here and gave him the cane. And with that, Dad jumped out the window and ran away and never returned. And, you know, that was Dad's education all of three days in the Gilgawi school. And then he he really learnt and, and educated himself about the, the, the business of the business of training racehorses. I, I read an interesting interview with you when somebody asked you whether you'd picked up a lot from your father, and you said, "No, I didn't pick up. I learned," which made me think that he, he was instilling in you the need to to learn for yourself, to figure out for yourself what what training was all about. Yes, well, you know, he was always there to, to teach me and guide me. And, and, you know, I used to go and have my pony in the stable, so I'd go in the morning, and I used to go as a small child with him to the track and ride in front of him on the, the baldy pony that was called Cornflakes. And we'd go out to the centre and he'd train the horses, and I don't know what, I, did, I can't remember, but it must have fiddled around. Oh, they, and then, uh, then he'd take me down to the beach, and we'd, they'd prop me up at the front of the boat, and they'd row out with the horses swimming behind at Coogee Beach. We don't do that. We still go to the beach but but not at Coogee anymore all the half naked boys and girls are there now uh, but it was fast fantastic you know it, it was and then we'd go after to, to Centennial Park which is a mini version of Hyde Park and we go looking for for ducks eggs in the the, the bushes or you know in the, in the low grass around the, the ponds but of course the duck egg was an egg that mum had left out for him in the morning to put in his pocket and one day I must have bumped up against him and squashed the egg in his pocket and of course we never saw any more duck eggs out <laughs> but he was fantastic no, he was great and just just in terms of the the actual mechanics of the training are you still applying those to your horses now decades on from what you learnt in the 1950s 60s 70s very much so, and some probably Dad would say not well enough. <laughs> but Adrian too. Adrian, uh, he said, "Look, I, I want to learn what what you have here and what you have there." He said, "I want want to learn," uh, and uh, so we're there bib and bubbing, and you know, I, I will say such and such, so and so, and chip in or or speak to him beforehand about a certain horse or uh, training. But yes, it's come. You know, when you've worked with the greatest. Why you don't have to? Why break the mould? The mould's perfect, and you know when you win 33 years consecutively of being champion trainer, unheard of in the world. When you win five Commonwealth records, six Golden Sippers, 43 Derbies. I mean, uh, golly gosh, it just went on and on and on. He was a phenomenon. He'd done the 33 consecutive titles, then he lost it, but it was the getting it back. After he'd, after he'd lost it, after the 33, that must take some sort of mental oh, strength. Huge, huge mental. And the stable had dwindled dramatically. You know, a lot of young trainers at the time had come on the scene. They were much sexier and they were younger. You know, you can't beat that, Nick. So they, these young trainers had come on the scene. And Dad to come back in the 34th was an enormous effort. And he knew that. And he knew it would be his final shot. And then it was gone. You know, the magic was gone. Uh, for you, great fortune to be his daughter but in a sense also a great responsibility how burdensome was that responsibility early or not at all no, no i didn't think it at all i wanted to, i wanted to train i want fiercely uh, to, to train and it's all i wanted to do and uh, when he accepted that which took a little bit of doing because he just said look it's too hard gay he said it's just not for you it's too hard and he was right it is hard and it's got harder as the years have gone on because you know there there's so many different trainers, there's, there's so many uh, different syndication groups, it's, it just goes on and on. But uh, he, uh, you know, he, he was great. He, when I did, he said, all right, he said, if you're going to apply for a license, you apply for a number one license. He said, start at the top. You never have to worry about going down, just start at the top. And, he, you know. and, and the whole business of you, of you getting your license was an ordeal, which has been extremely well documented. But the way you attacked it 
was because you you said that they weren't giving you a license because you were being discriminated against mm -hmm. because they were giving not giving you a license because you were married to someone that they weren't approving of at the time not because you were gay waterhouse because you were gay waterhouse no so after two and a half year legal battle uh, and i got the license it was granted to me um i then uh, took a while to start the horses and uh, i was picked up by one of the young stewards who said to me you know a funny bird he said you know you took so long to get the license why haven't you raced your horses and i said i'm not going to race them till i can absolutely get all of you to sit up and pay attention right. and you know i just trained winner after winner and 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 i knew i had to do that i knew i had to produce them so so they could win so people would say my gosh this girl really can train you know I knew I had to make I was no good me just sliding into it because I would have slid out just as quickly do you do you readily accept the idea that you were a, you were a pioneer for women in sport or is it something that you've rejected no I don't know look there are a lot of women in racing a lot of women in sport um, I've been tenacious I've been successful and so maybe that's what made me a pioneer. But I don't think I'm a pioneer. I think there are plenty of other women that would have a, a you know, a bigger star or a bigger, a bigger whatever. <laughs> was the idea of selling the sport, being someone who could project your enthusiasm for the sport to the media, something you were always conscious of? Or did it just come naturally to you? Well, I sat opposite my father, as we're sitting opposite each other now, Nick, from the day I was born till the day I left home, and I watched how he, when I say work the media is probably the wrong word, but he was in tune totally and understood how important the media is to our business. So every morning at a quarter to seven, he'd be on the phone. If he wasn't ringing one of his owners, he was on the phone to Jack Elliott or, uh, you know, any of the leading journalists. And he was talking to them and telling them about the horses racing. So they had a story. They had something to print. Because in those days, we didn't have iPhones. We didn't have, you know, all this other social media. We had the papers. We had the radio. We, we had television. But, you know, he was there making sure that people knew about his horses. Not bumping his chest saying, I'm Tommy Smith. He was saying, my horse is doing this. And you can back it on Saturday. And you can do it. People want that. They want that confidence. They want that leg up. They want to read it in the press and say, Smith said so-and-so. Or Waterhouse said, you know. Do you ever feel like, oh, God, you know what, I'm just not interested. I don't want to talk to anyone today. I, I just don't feel up for it. Or do you have to get yourself up every day? Well, when five favourites have been beaten, I feel very much like that, Nick, yes. <laughs> I could dig a hole and jump into it. But all people feel like that, you know. Those emotions of feeling down are part of the elation of when you, when you win. And if you can't ride that roller coaster, you shouldn't be in the sport. So you have to have a, an evenness of temperament. How, how important do you think evenness of temperament is for someone to excel in, in, in horse racing? I think it's essential in any sport. And I'm lucky I have a, a wonderful partner in life in Rob. And, you know, I'll come home and say, oh, I can't stand it. Drives me crazy. Chat, 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 chat. And he just lets it flow over. And then I've got it off my chest and off we go and have dinner and we're fine, you know. And, and am I right in thinking that it was it was him who kind of spurred you and motivated you the morning you won the Melbourne Cup because you were starting to, to self-doubt because you had such an obvious chance. That was so funny. We got there and we had this beautiful horse, Forente, and the first start he ever had in Australia, which was a year before, was the first time he ever stepped foot on an Australian racetrack. He ran second in the Melbourne Cup the previous year and he paid his purchase price in one go. Boom. Then we had a number of other races throughout the year with him being very competitive and very successful. We go to the cup and we're short price favourite. And every person in the whole wide world must have come and said, Good luck, Gary. This is your cup. I thought, oh, I can't stand it. What happens if I don't win this Melbourne Cup and I let all these people, what are the green men going to say to me when I walk on the racetrack? Oh dear, nice butt. I thought, I just don't think I can face it. I said to Rob, I don't think I can go to the races today. He said, what are you talking about? I said, oh, you know, I just don't want to let anyone down. He said, oh, for heaven's sakes, go out, win the cup and come on back home. <laughs> Lovely. And it, and, it, and it worked out beautifully. It worked out beautifully. <laughs> if you've gone your whole career without winning that race, Presumably, as an Australian trainer, that it, it's like not winning the Grand National if you're a jump jockey here, or the Gold Cup, or the Derby, or, uh, probably all rolled into one, isn't it? Well, it's a, it's a race because I don't think people in England or Ireland or Europe appreciate there are so few two-mile races, Nick, in Australia, and it has got so much prize money. You know, it's, it's astronomical the prize money, and it is recognised because on television it is covered over 
you know, what is 500, or I don't know how many countries of the world zip into this race run on the first Tuesday in November in Australia. And it's, uh, and it's also one of our oldest races, you know, in a country that's relatively new, you know. Um, so uh, for that reason, uh, uh, that, you know, not that many people train stairs, not that many people can do it. When you do do it, there's an enormous feeling of satisfaction. And for the owners, the excitement and the way the VRC build the event. And as you know, when you go into yeah. Melbourne, you know something really important is happening because there are banners everywhere and the cabbies talking to you. What what do you like in the cup he says you know <laughs> what's this cup you know you're carried along and it doesn't last for the, the the whole carnival runs for six weeks so for six weeks at Caulfield uh, then Mooney Valley then Flemington then Sandown is this wonderful sort of you know rocky road to, to riches it, it, it's a, it must have been a, a fantastic experience. I, I wanted to ask you a little bit about uh, prize money in, in Australian racing, which we all envy hugely here. Racing for these massive purses, we saw how, how much money Winx retired with. There's been a bit of a row this week between uh, Amanda Elliott and her counterpart in, in New South Wales about the tit for tat, I've got more money than you have. Uh, do, do you see that as a, as a healthy rivalry or is it getting unhealthy between the two states? As a rivalry, as it might be between North and South of England or England and France or Ireland and, and uh, Northern Ireland, Southern you know, Ireland. But rivalry is good and without rivalry, without competition, the sport would, would dwindle. And aren't we lucky that in Australia we are able to offer to the owners and to, to the participants for little money to be invested in for great return. So I think it's a wonderful story. It's a wonderful scenario. So and in a keep, sense, keep the rivalry going. Just just keep <laughs> piling on more money from all big races. Well, it's not so much that. Look, they work very hard. The clubs and the racing bodies work very hard uh, to uh, to be able to generate the money. A lot of it comes through sponsorship, some of it comes through uh, government funding, other comes from the tab. You know, all different sources make up that. But you know, the sponsorship's huge. And if the sponsor uh, thinks that's the right race to be sponsoring, because I know I'm going to be on 500 television stations across the world, then that's what they do. And I know in the past you've been very generous about the heritage and prestige of British racing. But do you think here in, in Britain, Royal Ascot and everything else notwithstanding, we need to put more money into our big races if we're going to attract the Australian horses that we're not getting anymore? Well, you, you attract the Australian horses anyway, but you, they come for a different reason. They, they come for the prestige of being able to win on a very difficult course, be it Ascot or Goodwood or York because the tracks are so diverse they're so testing of the horse um, you know to think that Royal Ascot if you stand at the, the, the start of the Jubilee course you, you can't see the stand yeah. that's how the gradient is so r remarkable we don't have that in Australia so you come for a different reason to enhance the Colts reputation so he can be more accepted you know uh, as the Coolmore when they bought um, Merchant Navy last year, yeah. and, and then he was able to win the Coolmore in uh, as a three-year-old come over here and win the, the Diamond Jubilee. There you are, yeah. and and all of a sudden people say in both North and South, hey, look, we know that horse. Oh yes, I'd like to send a mare to him. So once again, his career is enhanced. How long do you think we can live on our reputation? Do you think we can carry that on in, in perpetuity, offering relatively little prize money? And seems to work, doesn't it? I mean, uh, for the prize money, I can't comment. Uh, 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 that's something for only the government and the racing bodies to sort out. But it, it certainly attracts people from all over the world. This year in the Jubilee, I think your, Nick Smith was telling me, you've got Singapore represented, you've got America represented, Wesley Ward's bringing seven two-year-olds. I mean, you know, it's just fantastic. And a New Zealander as well? Absolutely. <laughs> How could I be so stupid? Of course. <laughs> yes, exactly. Very important. And, and ju just as far as... Um, it's, it's quite interesting that I'm talking to you today because it seems like... I can find a connection with you to almost every news topic that's germane to British racing at the moment. You're not enough women riding winners at Royal Ascot. Um, we talked a little bit about prize money and you've talked about the rivalry in Sydney and, and Melbourne. The other hot topic, David Redvers, who you'll know well, he's, he said that we're just not looking after our owners properly in this country and we're not doing enough to attract 
a broader spectrum of owners from different social backgrounds into into horse racing in, in the UK like you do in Australia. But look, that's up to every individual trainer to do that. You know, uh, I think Adrian and I do it extremely well. Uh, but it, you, you, you have to open your door to them. Now, you know, my father said, don't open your door every day to your owners because you won't get anything done. You know, it's like saying, come and sit with my, if I'm a stockbroker and sit with me all day long, you'd never get anything done. So every Sunday we open our stables for a couple of hours. They come in anyone, any of the owners or friends, and we do things for charity where people come and they can pat the horse and have a chit chat, have their photo taken. We go in to a very nice house that I've decked all out in dad's racing colours and we cheer the winners home and have a couple of champers. You know, it's great. And they get to meet each other. It's like a club. They get to meet each other. It's not costing them. You know, once you bought, bought your share in your horse, you're part of that natural club. It's lovely, you know. And communication is very important. You know, it's easy to communicate in this day and age. You just got to have the mindset to do it. And you're evidently a, a natural communicator. To what extent do you do you enjoy that entertaining uh, of all your owners, or is it is it simply a function of the job? No, look, I, I enjoy people. But I get tired and, and I've got to have some gay time, I've got to have some time to, for gay to let down, otherwise she couldn't do the hours and, and, and the longevity of the job. But, uh, you know, we're very geared to make sure that they enjoy it, because if they enjoy it, we enjoy it. You know, it's no good going there with the sour puss as they say, mm -hmm. you know, you, you want, the, the, the hardest thing is when the poor owner hasn't won the race and he's run somewhere down the track, you have to somehow build their hopes that we can go in to fight another battle, you know, and that's, the, 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 I think you owe it to them, you really do. Overall, have you enjoyed your owners? Have they been a good, have they been a good bunch as a group? They're very good, they're very diverse, they're very interesting. And look, you know, I say to people, you can, I can train from sort of the Prime Minister of Australia, well, not that I have, but Dad did, uh, from, from, you know, Bob Hawke, down, you know, where can I pick up the phone and the, the leading businessman in the world will pick up the phone to speak to his jockey or trainer and he will let another call go past. And that doesn't happen in any other business. It only happens in sport. Because people love sports people. People love to have a bet. They love the inside oil. You know what I mean? It's a wonderful position to be in. I feel I'm very privileged. As far as um, you say you need some gay time, what does gay time consist of now? Oh, mainly family. Uh, we have five grandchildren, which keep me exceedingly busy in the afternoons after the stables. And I'm just about to have a little lie down and think I'll just have a bit of gay time. And I hear, Gigi, Gigi. <laughs> it's great. It's, it's a, a different dimension to Rob, Rob and my life. We've got two children, Tom and Kate, who we adore. And they're, they're very, we've got a close family group and we spend a lot of time with our family. We love it. But does it in any way meaningfully change the way you go about your work or not? It changes that I've... I see Adrian as the boss and me as, the, as his lieutenant. Mm -hmm. So yes, the, the order of guard has changed, Nick, but I want that so that I can also, one, teach him, I love teaching people, two, make, keep the business successful, and three, have some time for you know, family time. And how, how robust is your relationship if you think he's made a massive foul up of something. How front foot are you with him? How forthright are you with him? At the end of the day it's his business so we may have a verbal strong debate about a different matter or horse. At the end of the day I say your decision. He's no, he's no fool. He very much thinks it out. He always makes the right decision. Now I, as I said to you, if you make the wrong decision you won't make it a second time. So don't worry about it. We all make the wrong decision at some time. And if you don't make the wrong decision, how do you know how to be the, it's the right decision to go on? It's so important for him. So important for our business. When somebody asked you about how you train people, you said it's my way or the highway. Yet everyone I've spoken to who's ever worked for you always speaks very fondly of their time and says how much they've they've learned and those two things don't necessarily sit that comfortably together so there must be a bit of it there, there must be a bit of bend there the ones that aren't going to make the grade or aren't going to I can't mold as the highway <laughs> but the ones that I can see that are receptive 
to me trying to mould them because I'm not trying to I'm not trying to change the essence of them. I'm trying to help them that they'll be more successful in life. If I can have some way of helping them along that road, then they're on my we're on the same plane, and I'll be behind them 110 percent. I get huge enjoyment out of that. What are the key similarities or differences between your training of the horses and your training of the people? Discipline, um, ebbing and flowing. You can put a certain amount of pressure on a horse or a person and then you've got to know when to let the pedal up before you break them. You don't want to break the horse down. You don't want to break the person that they won't listen to you and they'll go the other way. So I think that. I think I have to use these enormously. If you can't pick up around you the things that are going to be your aids to training that horse, then you shouldn't be training. And do you see yourself as, a, as an intuitive trainer rather than a, a trainer who bases everything on cold, hard evidence? You need a bit of both. Um, but I train from what I see and feel and I'm very much, I like to see the horse in the morning when he comes out in front of me. So of 150 horses, each I believe are trained individually. So as I look at the horses, you can cut and cut to measure the suit that will be fitting Nick or, you know, uh, David or Bruce, whoever it might be, that you've got that suit that fits them. No use having something that you think, I mean, uh, we'd love to think that everyone's a horse we train as Pierre of Vancouver, but they're not, you know, most of them fall a lot less, so you have to try to, and all the great trainers around the world do the same thing. Everybody who, who knows anything about you knows that you you had a, a career as a, an actor briefly, um, but was it ever really on the cards that you wouldn't go back to, to racing? I don't know about that. All I wanted when I came to England in the 70s, all I wanted to do was act. There was no even vague thought of being a, a horse trainer. I loved horses. I loved the stables. I even owned a horse when I was over here trained by William Huntingdon uh, called Budding Star. <laughs> 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 and, and, you know, uh, we had great fun. I mean, you know, I just, uh, uh, I loved being in the theatre, but I, I just felt I would never be quite, I wanted, I suppose, that star, that thing of, will one become successful? And I didn't feel that I, it was the right career for me. And it took probably nearly three years being here before I thought, I woke up one morning, I'd just finished Doctor Who, it was December. Dad had been driving me mad through Mum to come home. And I just thought, no, it's time to go. It's time to pack my bags and go. Something inside me just said, it's time to go, Gay. And I just packed up and came home. Are there people you particularly look at and really admire and think he or she has got something there that is somewhat intangible, but I'd quite like a little bit more of that? Oh, absolutely, absolutely. And in every country of the world, and every country of the world, Rob and I learn something and we, we take it back to Australia and try to incorporate it one way or the other doesn't always work but you know we're definitely learning all the time and there's so many successful and, and wonderful good trainers great trainers not good great trainers around the world uh, who who really inspires you mm, nowadays a number of them um, either young or old well um, no the, 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 the mixture uh, Wesley Ward's one of my great pin-up boys I just think he's a remarkable trainer uh, and a very diverse trainer uh, I'm greatly admiring of John Gosden, who handles her uh, s with such a plum and such uh, marvellous ability to handle not only uh, a very large stable, but at group one level year after year after year. Um, Michael Start, another great trainer, very, very admiring of. You know, he's got that fire in his belly. Yeah, very much absolutely. So. Uh, and, you know, uh, Aidan O'Brien, how can you not be admiring of Aidan, you know, uh, he's a remarkable. In Australia, Chris Waller, how can you not be admiring of him, handling a huge number of horses uh, and built from nothing, come from another country to Australia to, and built a huge empire, you know. Uh, but all of them, you know, uh, they were all, uh, they're all good trainers in there. Anyone who gets to the top level of their profession is very good at what they do. They don't, don't get it by chance. And what is the next chapter in this, in this amazing story? Can you, can you envisage it quite? Uh, 
What's the next chapter? Look, I don't really know what the next chapter is, Nick, except that I'm enjoying the part of the, chip, the book I'm in at present. You know, it, it's good. Gay Waterhouse, thank you very much indeed. Thanks, Nick.